Hello everybody and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 239. This week the questions are taken from guides 286 and 287 on the carrier Akagi and the Russian battleship Navarin, and the Wednesday videos on HMS Warrior and the Supermarine Seafire, with an additional question or two thrown in from the Friday video as to whether HMS Hood and USS Iowa count as battlecruisers or fast battleships. Yuri Zero asks, why did the Japanese Navy not develop triple turrets for their battleships before the Yamatos. A part of it was just that triple turrets are re relatively complex compared to twin turrets, but the other issue, which is with the Japanese Navy the overriding one really, is that the Japanese were very conscious of the fact that if they had to fight anyone on their own without any allies, they were going to be outnumbered most likely because they were really at the point they were designing the Fusos, Isos and Nagatos essentially thinking about fighting the Americans and in that circumstance they took a look at the Fusos and Isos and they thought right we want 12 14 inch guns that gives us a lot of guns to point at the enemy now whereas the Americans had four triple turrets in their 12 gun 14 inch ships the Japanese thought all right we are probably going to have to engage multiple opponents with our ships so that that's part of the reason for having 12 guns so we can allocate let's say six guns per target but if we go the american route and we have four triple turrets if one of our turrets takes a hit and gets knocked out and if you are fighting 2v1 that's a relatively reasonable supposition for that to happen at some point during the fight then you've lost one quarter of your entire armament and if you are engaging uh, you know, half your guns on one half your guns on the other you've lost half the battery that you're aiming at that opponent whereas if you do what they did historically which is to have six twins then if you lose a given turret instead of losing one quarter you've only lost one sixth of your armament and in terms of the specific target that you're shooting at you've only lost one third instead of one half of the armament you're shooting at them and there is another fact to bear in mind there which is that if you are firing two triples and you lose one of them you're down to a three gun salvo which you'll remember is not really ideal for range finding whereas if you're firing three twins and you lose one you have a four-gun salvo left, which is the minimum realistic number that you need for range finding. So it gives their ships a longevity in combat against multiple opponents, at least as far as the Japanese are concerned, which they think is very useful. And even if you're not being hit in the turret, it also allows you to, for a slightly more granular redistribution of fire. So let's say, for example one of the enemy ships that you're engaging is already listing or burning or in some way is significantly combat impaired if you have four triple turrets and you want to then maybe concentrate fire on the more intact enemy and you redirect three of your four turrets at the opponent then you're left again with a three gun salvo which you may then start missing against your opponent that's a little bit down which might give him time to recover Whereas if you have six twins, you can maybe redirect a fourth turret. So you've got three and three, and then you redirect one. So you now have four and two. And that allows you to now bring an eight-gun salvo to bear against the more intractable opponent. But you still have that four-gun salvo to bear on the one that you're just trying to basically keep down and sink. Which is very useful again. When it comes to the Nagatos, that is partly complexity partly also just size restrictions because you do need a fairly substantial ship to mount triple 16 inch turrets i mean both nagato and colorado are both going for twin 16s the british admittedly are looking at triple 16s but you've got to remember that when you get to the british and the triple 16 that's a derivative of the g3 design which a is you know half a generation to a generation later than the colorados and nagatos and the Nelsons are being built right up to the treaty limits and the triple turrets space saving is a huge factor in the decision to adopt that 
the British basically knowing that they're going to have to save as much space as humanly possible with the G3s and N3s moved to the triple at that point. And then once those ships have been built, then the next stage of battleship development is, of course, the North Carolinas and the King George V for the British, but the next stage for the Japanese is the Yamatos. So essentially they've made a decision for their 14-inch ships based on being outnumbered. The 16-inch decision is based more on size restrictions than anything else, and then the next one is the one where they adopt the triple. A light foot, except with a T's, replaced with sevens, asks, why would the Japanese leave crew aboard Akagi when they were about to scuttle her? Well, interestingly enough, unlike some of the Japanese ships that went down midway, Akagi's captain didn't see the need to go down with his vessel. So everybody who could be evacuated was evacuated from Akagi before she was sent to the bottom. However, obviously, a number of men did go down with the ship, and this comprises essentially of two groups. You have the men who were aboard who were already dead as a result of the bomb blasts and the fires because, well, the ship was on fire and then the ship was sinking so they needed to evacuate and unfortunately part of evacuation procedures when a ship is in that bad a state doesn't allow for the carriage of several hundred bodies out. And then there would have also been a small group of people who were trapped deep inside the ship and couldn't get out. Now, they did do, as I mentioned earlier, two stages of evacuation. They tried to get as many people as out as possible when it became clear that the ship probably couldn't be saved and just left aboard the command crew and the damage control personnel. But then when it became clear that the fires were not going to be contained at all, then they also were evacuated. However, as with a number of the other Japanese ships at Midway, Akagi was burning quite badly, and there would have been men in compartments aboard the ship where they'd managed to seal themselves off from either fire or flooding or both, and potentially would have still been alive, but unable to exit their area of the ship. So some of them would have gone down with the vessel as well. But uh, the Japanese weren't in the habit of leaving behind people who wanted to be evacuated. They did appreciate the need to evacuate experienced crew, and so there wasn't anyone deliberately left aboard who could have otherwise been rescued. Obviously, in some other cases, like with Hiryu, there were people who could have been rescued who deliberately chose to stay aboard, but that's a somewhat different thing. Sir Munchyman asks, In Drydock 197, while talking about the torpedo hit on USS North Carolina by I-19, you mention impact angle as a factor. Assuming a torpedo of any type found in the time period you cover functions as intended and detonates properly, how would the impact angle affect the subsequent damage suffered by the target vessel? So there are two major and one minor factors involved here. The minor factor is if the torpedo is using a shape charge warhead, that's obviously going to direct the explosion forward relative to the direction that the torpedo is traveling in. And so if it hits at an angle, it's going to direct that explosion partially across the torpedo defense system as much as into it. Now, the reason that's a minor factor is because although shape charge warheads are more common in some Cold War era torpedoes, technically they exist in World War II as well, but only in a very limited number of special warheads fitted to the Japanese Type 91 torpedoes right towards the end of World War II. So it's a very technically possible factor if for the World War II but not generally. The two major factors, well, one of which comes from something that you mentioned when, you know, assuming that it detonates properly. If the torpedo hits at a rather extreme angle, there is a very good chance, chance that it won't because the impact fuses on most torpedo warheads rely on rapid deceleration to trigger them, you know, like, say, a couple of tons worth of torpedoes slamming into the side of a ship at anything between 30 and 50 miles an hour and if that impact force is somewhat lessened by let's say the torpedo impacting at 70 or 80 degrees to perpendicular then it's a very possible that the 
warhead might not actually detonate because there may not be enough immediate force exerted on the fuse for that to happen which is of course going to save the ship albeit there'll still be a, be a dent or it may be that the torpedo as a result if the impact angle isn't quite so acute it might penetrate the first layer of the ship's hull bearing in mind that outer torpedo plating isn't exactly going to be that thick but it might then impact uh, some kind of structural support beam or something perhaps a bit more solid like depending if you've going if void liquid void liquid or liquid void liquid void but assuming for a moment you have impacted a ship where the outer defense is a void and the next layer of defense is a liquid that's going to be slightly better supported and that might just about exert enough force to set off the fuse whereas the void backed outer layer might not and all of these things are very variable you have to also then take into account how much the torpedo may or may not have slowed down when it hits that outer layer that the next layer in that might also affect the force that of to whether or not the fuse is going to detonate but assuming for the sake of argument that the torpedo has hit at, let's say arbitrarily 45 degrees and has detonated as opposed to a torpedo that has detonated because it's impacted at near enough 90 degrees this then depends on a couple of more small factors um, one of which is what shape is the warhead because although you know it's a unitary explosion it's just the whole thing theoretically detonates approximately at once the exact layout of the warhead might make a difference because some early torpedoes basically just have a cone of explosive with a fuse embedded in them whereas if you look at the diagram of a mark 14 you'll see that there's ballast at the bottom of a mark 14's tor torpedoes warhead compartment as well as the mark 6 exploder so the mark 14's warhead is not just a unified cylinder of explosive but whatever the torpedo in question is doing if a torpedo hits directly uh, perpendicular to the target we can see from torpedoes that were duds that the sheer kinetic force of the torpedo can often carry it through part way into the ship or into the torpedo defense system so although the fuse is obviously or the exploder is designed to detonate pretty sharpish otherwise it's just going to end up being crushed a torpedo that hits full speed at a lovely 90 degree angle may well have at least a portion of its warhead forced through the hull and into the first layer of the torpedo defense system before it detonates that in turn is going to cause more damage to the rest of the ship because the explosive doesn't have to overcome the outer hull plating quite as much if at all and it's already you know compromised the first layer of the defense system assuming it's hitting on the defense system if it hits outside the defense system then you've got a warhead that's actually got part way or all the way into the hull before it detonates again more likely to impart more of its explosive energy to the ship thus doing more damage whereas an angled impact it might you know be it let's say it's enough to cause the torpedo to detonate but if it's only at that point say dished in the hull plating or only very slightly penetrated the hull plating then some of that explosive energy is going to have to go into completing the penetration of the outer hull plating and then into the first layer of the torpedo defense system or the first layer of the hull if it's outside of that system and more of the explosion is going to occur outside of the hull which is then going to displace and move around water now the water will obviously contain a lot of that and direct it back into the ship but it is still an overall energy loss so broadly speaking the closer to perpendicular an impact a torpedo gets there is going to be a bit more energy and a bit more explosive delivered to the ship rather than to the outside environment but of course exactly whether or not this makes a huge difference will depend quite considerably on what kind of torpedo is being shot at you so if it's a downsized midget submarine torpedo or an 18 inch airdrop torpedo and it hits you at quite a significant angle that may actually make a substantial difference to how much damage it does to the ship whereas if it's something like a long lance which is carrying a huge amount of explosive then it probably isn't going to make a absolutely huge difference whether that torpedo has hit and punched its way through the hull plating on a 90 degree impact or if it's hit you at 45 degrees and detonated a couple of feet back there will be some difference 
but it's unlikely to make all that much difference to the grand scheme of things. ICQME asks, is being overweight and having armour too low in the water a common problem for pre-dreadnoughts? It's a problem that occurs, broadly speaking, over two periods. Now, it's not un uncommon for the issue to arise generally, but it is specifically a problem in two specific periods of ship development, one of which is the latter part of the ironclad and early pre-dreadnought period, and then the next part is the early to mid dreadnought period so kind of 1905 through to not quite but almost the beginning of the first world war and the reason for this is that when you get to the latter ironclad and early pre-dreadnought period you have the hail of fire concept being developed now prior to this ironclads had gone through a bit of a developmental process but essentially the idea of the central citadel was still there some of them had extended thinner belts some of them didn't but the central citadel tended to be relatively tall but when you got towards the end of the ironclad period not only were the really really big guns really really heavy and really powerful but with the hail of fire dictating that you needed to try and protect a lot of the ship's hull thus leading to the distributed armor concept the incredibly thick amounts of compound armor that you needed to protect the central portion of the hull where the machinery and the bar barbettes were from incoming fire meant that just through sheer weight you couldn't have a huge height of it and thus the you see the main belt become quite short at height wise and of course this means that if you get your weight calculations ever so slightly wrong then you can end up with a good chunk if not all of your main belt actually being below the water because if your belt is only four five maybe eight foot tall then if you've say calculated with a six foot high belt to have two feet below the water and four feet above the water but you miscalculate your loadings and so at deep load you actually end up a couple of feet further down than you did before and you're already accounting for two feet perhaps being lost between light and deep loading anyway so you've gone from two foot below the water four foot above light loaded and four foot below two foot above at deep load to now having zero of your belt armor above the water as you go through to the last part of the pre-dreadnought period and into the early dreadnought period this becomes less of a problem because Harvey Steel and Krupp Steel allow you to have a much more extensive coverage. But then as you get into the Dreadnought era and suddenly you're having to cover more of the ship because you now have super firing turrets or just extended turret farms as well as the machinery. So proportionally the belt is becoming longer again and people apart from in the latter stages of the Dreadnought era in the US, everyone else is still using distributed armor. Once again, the demands on weight are getting more and more, and suddenly you start to find issues with some ships in that period. Again, the main portion of their belt where it is at its thickest, perhaps riding a bit too low for comfort. And then as you get out of that into the Treaty Era battleships and beyond, then you start to see a, because of partly the square cube law and partly just because of everyone adopting all or nothing for the most part then you start to see the height of belts actually become uh, significantly more once again so if you compare the height of say the king george v class belt with the height of dreadnought's belt or the height of hms trafalgar's belt you'll see that you know you could actually make a fair degree of error in the loading of a king george v and you'd still have lots of belt armor both above and below the water, whereas with those earlier ships, you really couldn't. Sean O'Brien asks, I've heard that at least some early bridges were structures built between paddle boxes. Did these predate warriors? You're absolutely right in that a number of paddle ships did have their bridges built between the paddle boxes. It seemed like a logical place to put them apart from anything else. But you have to usually take into account two things when you're looking at them one is what type of ship is it is it a warship or a civilian ship um, because obviously the demands for a bridge 
are rather different between the two. So you might find a civilian paddle steamer with some kind of platform built between its paddle boxes, but that won't necessarily have precisely the same purpose as the bridge on a warship. Um, I mean, obviously, the navigation issue is definitely there, but obviously other command and control features, perhaps not so much. The other thing you also have to factor into account is when this paddle ship is, because the advent of the screw propeller did not immediately obsolete the paddle ship in any way, shape or form. Paddle ships were still used quite extensively in various places, both on rivers and at sea, for a variety of different reasons well after the point at which screw propulsion became common or the default on most warships. So if you see a paddle ship with a bridge structure either immediately forward or in between the paddles, obviously in that case it obviously had that, but it may very well be that that paddle ship actually post-dates HMS Warrior because navigation and command and control even on a ship of the line when everything is right aft as it is technically on warrior as well that could still be done with objects in the way yes the funnel made things slightly more awkward but if you go on a preserved sailing vessel like constitutional victory you'll notice the masts are just as much of a problem even if perhaps they're a little bit thinner than the average funnel but part of the problem with warrior was not just the masts and funnels but also her sheer size and it's those two combined together that are kind of the contributors to the development of bridge structure whereas you can have paddle ships like say HMS Electo well before Warrior but with their ships relatively small size at that point the pressing need for overall bridge structure is somewhat less. The Blue-Eyed Gamer Wingnut asks, Recently I visited Warrior from Australia and had a chat with the historian on board. He mentioned that a live-fire test ship using Warrior's armour was made to see how Warrior would hold up, before Warrior was built, I assume. Was this the first time that this was attempted? I can't see any point in doing it before armoured ships came about, as shooting at wood just damages the product needlessly. The tests on what was called the Warrior target were very early armour tests. They weren't the earliest, um, but they were amongst the first. So there were some ad hoc armour tests that went back a little bit further. Um, for example, uh, within the Crimean War, when you first saw the armoured floating batteries, people took a few pot shots just to double check their work. But in terms of form formalised, organised testing, in the run up to the launch of Warrior, and of course with Gloire on the other side of the channel, there was quite a bit of discussion as to what exactly would constitute the best form of armour. Would it just be slabs of iron plate? Would it be iron backed with something? As it turned out, obviously the answer was iron backed with teak, but they looked at iron plates in multiple layers, iron girders crisscrossed over each other, and some of those would be implemented in various US civil warships, mostly through lack of any better materials. Um, but you also had some rather more interesting ones, uh, one of which was a kind of a rubber mixture substance, either as the front or the back part of armour armor plate layering, or as an armour in and of itself. And all of these, and more, uh, were tested in the 1850s. Uh, they're, most of the records that survive in English are unsurprisingly from tests done in the UK, uh, but there are references to various tests also done in France. So the tests, as I said, on, on something that simulates exactly the armour that Warrior would eventually end up with are amongst the earliest, but not the absolute earliest. But you are right in general in that tests on armor setups whether they be on land or mounted to the sides of ships pretty much only start in the late 1850s when people are thinking seriously about what are the effects to a ship if we try and stick some kind of heavy protective armor on it and then we shoot at it with the most powerful guns that we've got to hand knight 6831 asks would the supermarine seafire have benefited if the royal navy had gotten the gloucester f5-34 before the seafire in the Wales Has Wings alternate history book, this develops into the Gloucester G-38 Goshawk. 
I don't know if the strictly speaking the sea fire program would have benefited from it but certainly the fleet air arm would have bearing in mind that the fleet air arm in the 1930s they got the nimrod which is a single seat biplane fighter in the early 1930s and they basically had to put up with that until they got the skewer and the gladiator right at the end of the 1930s whereas this offering by gloucester comes about in 1934 and if it looks a little bit like a gladiator without the upper wing that's because that's kind of where they started with the design um performance wise it's obviously significantly superior to the biplane fighters and the skewer as well i mean compared to the skewer it's uh fair bit faster it carried well would have carried double the armament because it was designed for an eight gun fighter but the protracted development time meant that it was an RAF specification bear in mind um, and by the time the other competitors as well as the Gloucester one from the F-534 specification were beginning to fly there was now the much later specifications that would result in the Hurricane and Spitfire which were more capable still. And, you know, bear in mind that with the fact that you have the Nimrod as a single-seat fighter aircraft, the fleet air arm is not devoted and wedded to the idea of two-seat fighters. They do like them, and the specification that arose that eventually resulted in the Fulmar did call for two-seat fighters, but the fleet air arm was always looking at something of a mix because, well, apart from anything, they were also looking at the specification that would have led to the fully navalized Spitfire had war not broken out, which was obviously also a single-seater. So given that this uh, Gloucester offering would have been faster than the Fulmar with a similar level of armament, I think if the fleet arm had had these things entering service in 38, 39, something like that, um, then, well, apart from anything, the skewer could have been slightly redesigned towards a more specific dive bombing role which would certainly have helped it somewhat and it would have been a somewhat better aircraft to have around for the mediterranean conflict and so on and so forth it's not world beating as i said it was eventually cancelled because the spitfire and the hurricane were better than it but it sits kind of in between the fulmar and the spitfire dash c fire performance wise of course, you've got to persuade the Navy that they want it. You've got to persuade the RAF that they should let the program continue because at this point the fleet air arm is under RAF control. And there perhaps would be one other unexpected advantage to this, at least if they can make it have folding wings, which is that proportionally it is significantly smaller than a full mar. So you could get more of them onto a Royal Navy carrier, which would also help. But as for whether the sea fire itself could have benefited, um, I, well, there's not going to be a huge amount of lessons that you can translate structurally from the, this Gloucester aircraft over to the sea fire. But I think it could help or hinder. So it could help in that it would give the Royal Navy a single seat, relatively high performance fighter that it could deploy in the early part of World War II which would mean that the sea fire wouldn't have to be quite so rushed so perhaps they could take their time over getting it fully navalized especially considering that the performance figures that you're looking at are for a prototype which was initially designed in 1934 so it probably would be at least a couple of iterations in by the time world war ii breaks out so it might have a more powerful engine for example perhaps a Perseus or Taurus as opposed to its as designed Mercury assuming you stuck with Bristol engines you don't necessarily have to the flip side of course is that if you have a relatively decent performance single engined fighter in service with the fleet air arm then they may be put even lower on priority for development of a successor single engine fighter so perhaps that might have put the kibosh on having the initial design of navalized sea fire even though that didn't necessarily really go anywhere but it might also have led to the raf turning around in world war ii and saying to the royal navy well you've actually already got something um so we don't need to free up spitfire production for you just yet because you can make do with what you've got who knows how the internal politics so it could have helped it could have hindered i mean if you want to do an ideal version of helping if it's a fairly runaway success 
and you know proves the concept of a monoplane single seat fighter that's able to operate off of our air, of um, fleet air arm carriers in the latter part of the 1930s just before the war that might give the royal navy a bit more of a an impetus to go right well this is great but looking at the spitfire that's coming into service and the hurricane and the bf109 etc we need a successor to build from this pretty quickly and therefore we want a navalized spitfire and maybe you know that would might push the urgency a little bit more who knows redacted asks why were the aircraft carriers of other nations unable to carry as many aircraft as the american ones despite them being the same size well there's a few different things involved for one thing there actually aren't any carriers that are exactly the same size from the various different nations when you're looking in the run-up to world war ii um, so the yorktown class for instance are larger than soryu and hiryu but considerably smaller than the shikakus and ark royal is by displacement somewhat larger than a yorktown but by overall size because of various restrictions with um, dockyards etc actually just a fraction smaller albeit that if you're going to go cl the closest comparison is probably ark royal and a yorktown class but that there's still a reasonable margin of difference in sizes so first stage you know a, a smaller carrier physically smaller carrier can usually carry fewer aircraft second element is how you actually carry the aircraft that you've got because for example arc royal as well as actually displacing a little bit more than yorktown despite being slightly shorter overall has a greater hangar deck space than a yorktown class so you might think oh well therefore the arc royal should be able to carry more aircraft but there's another complicating factor Ark Royal has enclosed hangars, whereas the Yorktowns have open hangars, and that affects the overall internal volume. But as we just said, the area and volume of the Ark Royal's hangars is still larger. So what's the problem? Well, it's also the deck parking. This comes into how you carry your aircraft. The Royal Navy, for various reasons, but mostly weather-related when it comes to the North Sea, believe that a carrier's maximum aircraft capacity should be as many aircraft as you can fit in the hangar which was part of the reason why Ark Royal had a double height hangar, uh, as in two hangars. Um, but she could only fit a certain number of aircraft into that hangar, um, initially just over 70, but between the time of her conception and the time of her launch aircraft had become a bit bigger. So practically speaking, about 50 to 60. I think the most she had ever carried in life was a fraction over 60 but the Yorktowns are able to carry on paper at least up to 90 if not possibly more so what gives well as I said it's the deck parking if you are prepared to permanently or semi-permanently store aircraft up on your flight deck then of course that gives you much more area to store aircraft on so happy days you can now carry more aircraft another factor to, fact to consider is what are you doing in terms of spares with the american carriers especially yorktown and later essex class they have relatively tall hangars and therefore they got into the habit of storing a bunch of spare aircraft in the upper reaches of those hangars at least until the aircraft got too big to do that but again depending on the source you're looking at sometimes those aircraft are counted just straight up towards the ship's capacity so that's usually where you hit, see the kind of roughly in the 90s capacity for a Yorktown class aircraft carrier because they're just like, well, this is how many aircraft are physically on board. In terms of whether or not you can actually use those aircraft, that's another matter entirely. A Yorktown's actual complement of aircraft it can send out to fight somebody was typically more in the 70s because those aircraft been being stored up there were in bits and you may not necessarily have all the pilots to actually fly them all at once anyway even if you could fit them onto your deck which you can't if you've got all your pre-existing aircraft intact and if other nations either can't do that due to short hangar heights or just don't do that doctrinally or if they do do that but they don't do it to quite the same extent that's going to bring down the total number of aircraft that they can ostensibly carry. 
And then finally, you've also got to look at the balance of aircraft carried, because fighters tend to be the smallest of the aircraft, torpedo bombers tend to be the largest. So when you look at the air groups, say, look at a Japanese air group at the beginning of their involvement in World War II in sort of late 1941, early 1942, and you'll see that they have a fairly high proportion of strike aircraft and relatively few fighters. That means that overall, for a given square footage of hangar space, they, they can carry fewer aircraft because each of the Kate torpedo bombers is going to take up a lot of space. Uh, so, for example, on the Shikakus, their ostensible air group at the beginning of the war was supposed to be 18 fighters, 27 dive bombers, 27 torpedo bombers, and about a dozen spare aircraft. Whereas if you look at a typical US air group on a Yorktown class for, at the beginning of the war, they have the same number of fighters, 18, and the Wildcats, but they have 18 Devastators, 18 torpedo bombers, so that is nine fewer torpedo bombers compared to a Japanese carrier, and then they have lots and lots of Dauntlesses in scout and bombing squadrons. But the Dauntless is much closer in size to the Wildcat than it is to the Devastator, so um, obviously not taking into account folding the wings once those are brought into account. The F4F is just under 29 foot in length and 38 foot in wingspan, and the Dauntless is just over 33 foot in length and with a just over 41 foot wingspan. So you're looking at a difference of just over four foot in length and just over three foot in wingspan, whereas the Devastator is 35 feet long with a 50 foot wingspan. <laughs> And this affects how you handle the aircraft, you know, regardless of wh which ones do and don't have folding wings. Obviously, the Devastator did have folding wings. The Dauntless, uh, at least at first, did not. But once those wings are unfolded, you know, that's going to affect, as I said, how you can line them up on the flight deck and everything. So having more Dauntlesses and fewer Devastators, weight issues as well, will affect the overall size of the air group. So plug all of these factors in and... Basically, depending on how each of those in particular affects a specific comparison, that gives you the answer as to generally why American carriers tend to have larger air wings or larger numbers of aircraft embarked than other contemporary carriers. Strictly speaking, if we take our closest comparison point, as we mentioned earlier, which is Ark Royal, if Ark Royal was to employ deck parking with a similar balance of aircraft as the US Navy employed, it would be able to physically carry more aircraft than a Yorktown class. But that's not how the Royal Navy did things. CCM asks, you and Dr. Clark have talked on occasion about what the potential final Queen Elizabeth, aka what would have been HMS Agincourt, might have been intended for. Would a small tube boiler equipped 15 inch gun toting vessel be to Hood what Montana was to Iowa? Something that, had it been built, would have been the battleship of Hood's generation and by extension turn Hood into a more conventional rule of thumb battle cruiser. As Dr. Clark has probably gone over in significantly more detail, there are lots of different ways that you could interpret the some vague indications we have as to what Agincourt historically would have been. As a, This is not the 12-inch gun Agincourt as actually existed. This is the theoretical 6th Queen Elizabeth class, which was notionally on the books and then was never actually ordered. And various interpretations have ranged from just a slightly modified version of the existing Queen Elizabeth design through to a version that carried nine 15-inch guns in three triple turrets, which is what you can see here I've mocked up, through to um, basically an Iron Duke but with 15-inch guns, i.e. with a fifth Q turret amidships, at which point you would use the small tube boilers to maintain performance, I would think. It looks something roughly like this. And then you've also got the potential for a Nevada style where, you know, again, potentially introducing the triple turret, but with a triple on the bottom, twin on top, uh, thus maintaining the four turret layout. And then with small tube boilers, potentially getting up 28 knots or just taking, you know, as I said, the Queen Elizabeth design and sticking small tube boilers on it and getting that up to 28 knots. Nonetheless, even if we go with uh, one of the latter interpretations such as this one, then that's not quite going to be a Montana to Hood as 
Montana historically was to Iowa uh, for a couple of reasons. So, okay, yes, it has more guns and Montana has more guns than Iowa. And yes, it's a bit slower with, you know, Hood in the low 30s, Iowa in the low 30s, and then this in the high 20s and Montana in the high 20s. But where the big difference is going to come is going to be armor because Montana was significantly more heavily protected than Iowa as well as all the rest, whereas an Agincourt, if it's still based on the Queen Elizabeth hull, is likely to still have that 13-inch armour, which means it's going to be about the same level of protection as Hood. Maybe it adopts the slightly improved efficiency layout of the Revenge class, but the protection, broadly speaking, is going to be equivalent, and therefore it's not quite the Montana equivalent to Hood that uh, the actual Montana would have been to an Iowa. Matt Kidd asks, in the film Master and Commander, Jack disguises the surprise as a whaler to lure in the Acheron. Would such a ruse be considered perfidy in the 20th century when feigning non-combatant status is prohibited, or would it be a legitimate ruse of war? So to lay some background, I think there's an excellent article by the US Navy War College, which I'm just going to quote here, so for the time period that the channel covers, the relevant bit is the Hague Regulations of 1907. So Article 23 of the Hague Regulations provides that it is especially forbidden to kill or wound treacherously individuals belonging to the hostile nation or army. Now, although it doesn't exactly say how that is supposed to be done, it's again, quoting from the article, generally accepted that the modern definition of perfidy encompasses three essential elements. An act inviting an adversary to believe that the international human rights law either entitles him to protection from attack or prohibits him from engaging in a particular attack. Two, the adversary's accepting of that invitation by then exposing himself to attack or by not attacking. And then three, intentionally betraying the adversary's confidence with harmful consequences. So if we consider that obviously what uh, Lucky Jack does at the time in the Age of Sail is considered perfectly acceptable. Now let's analyse it according to this vague wishy-washy bit in the Hague Convention and then, as I said from the War College article, the modern interpretation. So does disguising the surprise as a whaler invite the adversary to believe that it entitles the adversary to protection from attack, or does it prohibit him from engaging in a particular attack? Well, it doesn't entitle him to protection from attack because it was fairly well known in World War I or World War II that merchant ships may very well be armed to defend themselves against attack. So just because a ship appears to be a civilian does not necessarily mean it's not going to shoot back. It just might not be considered that it would shoot back as effectively. Um, does it prohibit the attacker from engaging in a particular attack? Well, again, it depends exactly how the, um, in, the raider in question is choosing to behave, because by the laws of war cruiser warfare, if you like, which is what everybody was trying to stick to, at least at the start of World War One, that theoretically forbids the attacker, the cruiser, whatever it is, from just blowing the merchant ship clean out of the water. But the those particular rules of war were abandoned relatively quickly by the U-boats, and then later on in World War II, we see that whether or not you stopped the ship to let the crew off or not was kind of just... Th either here or there, depending on the German radar and even depending on the situation. So if you think about, uh, for example, Operation Berlin, quite a number of Scharnhorst and Gneisenau's victims were stopped. The crew were allowed to leave the ship and then the ship was sunk. But then you look at the attack of Admiral Scheer on the convoy escorted by Jervis Bay. Now, Jervis Bay was a legitimate combatant, so they got in a fight. Um, obviously, Admiral Scheer won. But then when you look at things like the San Dimitro, the Bedfordshire, etc., at the Admiral Scheer just you know charged headlong and started shelling them so you know in that kind of situation pretending to, well a actually being a merchant vessel didn't stop you from being arbitrarily shot at and pretending to be a merchant vessel also wouldn't in the mind of the attacker be entitling them to protection from any particular form of attack 
So perhaps at the start of World War One, it could have been an issue. Uh, I mean, in some ways, the Q ships were, which the Germans were quite annoyed about when they started operating, are kind of doing the same thing that Jack Aubrey does with surprise luring in Acheron. But then we look at the other two sections: the adversary's acceptance that by invitation of the invitation that the target is a civilian by exposing himself to attack or by not attacking. Okay. Acheron was lured into a position where she could be more easily attacked. That's fair. And then three, intentionally betraying the adversary's confidence with harmful consequences. Now, that's the interesting one, because if you betray the confidence with harmful consequences, i.e. you shoot at them, then that would be a violation. So at the moment, we kind of definitely we've ticked box two, maybe one in certain circumstances, but probably not most of the uh, first half of the 20th century but then three you know if a soldier let's say pretends to be wounded therefore has certain um, protections in theory and then turns around and shoots somebody that's definitely betraying an adversary's confidence with harmful consequences when it comes to ships at least in the age of sail in the first half of the 20th century what seems to be the deciding difference is whether or not the ship has identified itself as a hostile before it opens fire. So you see this whole argument with Cormoran, you know, the, the fact that Cormoran as a Hilfskreuzer was explicitly designed to look like a merchant ship, but had hidden weapons and would then go around attacking people. Nobody has ever really said the Hilfskreuzer are perfidious violations of the laws of war. When it comes to Cormoran sinking Sydney, the main argument seems to be around whether or not Cormoran hoisted its Kriegsmarine ensign first, in which case it's accepted that, okay, that was a good ambush, or whether it still opened fire whilst pretending to be a civilian ship, in which case it was a war crime. Now, it might seem to be a relatively small distinction, but in international law and on the sea, it does make quite a large distinction. So... I think that given that when surprise attacks Acheron, they do hoist the white ensign first and then open fire, that would invalidate box three. So given that we have kind of a, a maybe on one, a tick on two, but a definite no on three, Jack Aubrey's specific actions in luring in the Acheron, providing he hoists the white ensign at the end, would be considered a legitimate ruse of war as long as that ensign goes up before the first guns fire. And that seems to be how everybody took armed merchant raiders, armed merchant cruisers, and those kinds of disguises during this period as well. Primark359 asks, how would a battle between lines of cruise ships that had a gun in every at every balcony turn out? Could they actually sink each other with gunfire from the guns that would fit in those windows, or would they have to close to board? Well, we kind of have the battle of the Cap Trafalgar versus the Carmania as a sort of guide. And the short version is merchant ships that start duking out, certainly these days, will very rapidly compromise each other's structural integrity and set each other on fire, even with the relatively speaking few guns that these two liners had. If you had cruise ships, well, they have two problems. One, there's going to be a lot more guns present. And two, as I've mentioned before, cruise ships are not really built to the same standards as full ocean-going ships. They're much, much more delicate and are going to contain a lot more flammables. So whilst it's entirely possible that a broadside battle between cruise ships might actually end up holding them below the waterline enough for them to roll over and sink very quickly... I suspect they will probably be turned into towering, uncontrolled infernos even faster. And assuming that the balcony is actually physically strong enough to hold the weight, which is a question that I don't know the answer for, but I would maybe be slightly leery of, but assuming that you open the door or the sliding door to the average cruise ship balcony, based on the various naval guns that I've seen, you could relatively easily get a three maybe a four inch gun mounting on there you'd need the, the doors on into the cabin open to deal with the recoil but the actual physical space of the balcony could fit a pedestal mounting for a single three inch or four inch gun so yeah if you covered a cruise ship in a hundred plus three or four inch guns let's say three inch guns for the 
uh, for ease of argument, yeah, both sides are going to absolutely murder each other in very, very short order. Rob Smith asks, how did the treatment and or management of seasickness develop during the period the channel covers? Unfortunately, not by a huge amount. The, the general treatment for really severe sickness was don't go to sea, <laughs> go and join somewhere else instead. Of course, you did have officers like Nelson who did suffer from seasickness at times. And of course, everybody's tolerance level for if dash when they get seasick is different. Some people won't get seasick at all. Uh, some people will be fine in normal circumstances, but can get very ill in a violent storm when the ship's pitching and rolling a lot. Um, for some people, it's specific types of motion. So if the ship's pitching and chucking itself around everywhere, it'll they'll be fine. Um, but if, say, it's in a gentle swell where the ship's just going up and down without changing pitch or roll all that much, that might set them off. Um, I know from personal experience, I don't tend to get seasick. In fact, I don't think I've ever felt seasick. But I know that some of my family members have been fine when they're out on deck and they're able to see the horizon. But if you lock them up in a cabin, then they get seasick. And that was one of the kind of vaguely standard-ish treatments that occurred, was around at the time, which was basically you know, stand up on deck, get some fresh air, look at the horizon and take slow, deep breaths. The d uh, invention and then distribution of commercial anti-motion sickness tablets, which I think is what you get given these days, as far as I can tell, doesn't really start until basically the time period the channel covers ends, i.e. the end of just after the end of World War II. So up until then, it's a case of, as I said, either look at the horizon, breathe deeply and hope for the best, or whatever, you know, old wives tale, old sailor's story, or local traditional remedy might otherwise be available to you. Ferris asks, could the Omaha class have been modernised by eliminating her casement guns and replacing them with barbettes? Or at that point, is it going down the rabbit hole of being so expensive as to rival a new ship? Unfortunately, yeah, you're pretty much looking at the, the cost of a new ship. The ammunition handling arrangements for the casement guns are entirely different to the turret and barbette ammunition handling arrangement, same, similarly with the magazines. And you'd have to, therefore, well, you'd have to cut down the entire superstructure that the barbette guns are, sorry, that the casement guns are in, um, then, and remove those guns, then you'd have to cut through loads of compartments on your way down, put in presumably some magazine space, or at least some ammunition handling space if you want to share space with the magazine forward, new ammunition hoist systems, new turret, presumably it's going to have to be a super firing turret, and you're going to have to repeat that exercise aft as well. And as you can probably tell from this picture of Marblehead, there's also not a huge amount of space for the kind of box turrets the US Navy was using at the time. So yeah, although in theory, replacing the barbettes with turrets would give you equal or greater firepower and obviously a bit more flexibility, you would end up spending so much money doing so that you'd be better off just building a new cruiser. Now, that's not to say it's absolutely impossible. Um, if you were going to adopt a newer, slightly more compact turret arrangement and you're doing like a full 1930s modernization, so replacing all the machinery, that would I would cut down on the length of the machinery spaces, perhaps also bring together some of the funnels that would allow you to probably well it'll be a bit of a pain but you could reposition the main mast uh, remove the aft superstructure that would maybe open up enough space aft to comfortably install a second turret and replace the existing one and while you're at it you might as well then also slightly rejig the forward superstructure open up a bit more space and then if you replaced both the existing front turret and the Barbet Z casement, sorry, with a new, more compact twin six inch turret, then you you'd be able to physically do it, but the expense would be ridiculous. Then we have of the museum ships you visited, is there anywhere in any of them that is not currently available for access that you hope will be accessible someday? I think a lot of it depends on 
what you mean by available for access, because there's available for access on a specifically invited tour, like I've managed to do, and you know the curators of the ships have been very generous in allowing me to do. And then there's available for public access. Because I think between the various museum ships I've been on, collectively, I think most of the areas that could be made public access have been on one ship or another. Although, obviously, there are some ships where the curators would probably dearly like to open certain areas to the public, but they haven't yet because restoration efforts are still ongoing. But of the areas that I've been to which, generally speaking, are not accessible to the average public visitor, for almost all of them, I can really understand why. Um, bearing in mind that I'm a young-ish, relatively fit-ish um, man in his mid-30s, at which point, you know, there are parts of the ship that I can get to relatively safely and, you know, enjoy. But then, equally speaking, I'm looking at those places and going, okay, some of these hatches, some visitors just are not physically going to fit through. Others, you know, if you tilt them sideways and feed them through, they might get through. But, you know, older visitors who are lacking in flexibility might not be able to fit through. Um, some places require you to go up and down ladders that perhaps the general public might not be able to handle, especially if they're kind of rope or cable ladders rather than fixed. Some places there's not any particular fixed footing. There's no decking or anything. So you have to pick where you're putting your feet carefully. And you know, A, the general public sometimes has problems with that. And B, um, you know, one or two people in that space is fine. But having a regular stream of visitors would be basically impossible. Um, then you've got issues of people who might suffer from claustrophobia, Um people who suffer from vertigo like I do, but perhaps suffer considerably worse vertigo than I do. And, you know, the fact that warships don't have to be OSHA compliant, at least not the museum ships. So there are some areas that to get visitors in would actually these days just legitimately be far too dangerous. Uh, so, for example, uh, although this is something I haven't actually done yet, it's something I do want to do at some point, but, for example, there's the emergency escape hatch in uh, a, an Iowa or South Dakota class battleships magazine. Now, you go through a hatch, that would be relatively easy. But then you're in a very, very small compartment, which is the bottom of a very small tube that goes up a very long way um, to the upper deck. And the only way to get out of there, unless you go back the way you came in, which you know isn't very exciting, is to climb multiple stories on a very narrow, very hard metal rung ladder. Now, if you are prepared to take the risk and you're relatively confident and you're relatively good at climbing, that could be a relatively fun, if somewhat tiring experience. If you're just feeding the general public through, it's probably only going to be a matter of days before somebody loses their grip and gets themselves killed. <laughs> so, you know, falling... 50 feet through a battleship is not going to be good for anybody. And as a result, you know, a lot of those areas I don't think ever would be or should be accessible to the general public. In fact, off the top of my head, I'm sure if I sit down and think long enough and hard enough, I'll probably come up with a few more. But I think at the moment, pretty much the only s space inside a warship, uh, a museum warship that I've been on, that I haven't had access to, at least on one ship or another, has been maybe looking at the catapult systems on an aircraft carrier. And I think that was more due to a lack of time, if I'm remembering my visits to Yorktown and Midway correctly, more so than a lack of availability. So, yeah, um, pretty much the areas that have been not visited or out of bounds are either areas where it's just a duplicate, so, you know, machinery room one, two, three, or four, well, you know, if you go to one on a ship, 
like an Iowa or Essex class, well, the others are going to be fairly similar, and other similarly repetitive areas like crew accommodations and so forth, or small storage rooms where it's just like, here is a small metal box, congratulations, or areas where it's, you know, legitimately unsafe for anybody really to be, which would normally be, you know, perhaps an area of the ship on an older ship that is currently in a decayed state, or perhaps was never meant to be accessed from within the ship, like, say, a torpedo defence blister. But for individual ships, there are areas that I would like to be open for public access that would be pretty cool, but as I mentioned, there that that's a lot of uh, restoration work that the ships have to do to get them accessible. And then there are a few borderline cases which might be kind of special tour accessible, uh, but would require a lot of waivers and so forth. And finally for this week, Nick Brodar asks, when did specialised damage control personnel become common? I think that depends quite a lot on how you defined specialised damage control personnel, because on an Age of Sail ship, you could make a reasonable argument that the ship's carpenter, and where necessary his apprentices, constitute specialised damage control personnel. They don't have any particular combat role, they're far too valuable to lose being randomly shot down manning a gun or something like that, but as well as their, you know, peacetime or non-combatant time role when they're just maintaining the ship, when once the ship gets holed by incoming fire, they have a very specific role in patching and making good the ship or, you know, repairing the ship if it suffers damage from storms and so forth. So you could say that's a form of specialised damage control personnel, at which point, you know, they're common across ships as soon as ships are large enough to afford to carry dedicated carpenters. Um, but if you mean in terms of a border warship, this guy is specifically in charge of general damage control, you know, pumping, patching, firefighting, etc., that tends to come about, approximately speaking, in the middle part of the latter half of the 19th century, so kind of the 1870s, 1880s, as ships become complicated enough that there's actually now very specialist equipment that needs someone with specialist knowledge, and also when ships actually become compartmentalized to the extent that damage control is actually worth doing beyond the there is a hole in the hull we need to plug the hole in the hull level so true bulkheads and compartmentalization start out in kind of the 1840s they're being designed in the 1830s wooden ships before that do have some bulkheads but they're not really true watertight things and then once you get into the age of the ironclads you start to have definitive compartments which People are like, oh, well, if this is flooded, well, we close this and then this shouldn't be flooded, but we're all going to need damage control to try and pump that out, to try and patch things up, to make sure the rest of it isn't flooded. And then the systems to do that start to become more complex from hand pumps to steam pumps and then to electrical powered equipment and so on and so forth. And as the complexity grows and the size of the ships grows, so the need for specialised personnel comes in. So, hence my answer, probably around about the 1870s to 1880s, depending on the Navy, of course. Um, with some navies, as we know from the 20th century, you would have specialised damage control cadres. And in other navies, it would be roped into the general duties of some of the other uh, crew aboard. And then they would instruct everybody else and people would receive more general damage control training. And that's it for this week. Thank you very much for listening, if indeed you still are, and I hope you have a decent rest of the week until you run into another video. See ya!